Good afternoon. My name is Mary Meg McCarthy, and I'm the Executive Director of the National Immigrant Justice Center. Welcome to our quarterly policy corner. Uh, today's topic is regarding the ICE detention system and unfortunately its expansion and NIJC's role in fighting and advocating to end immigrant detention. It is a critical time in our country and we now have an opportunity to really move forward and advance a fair and humane immigration system that does not include immigrant detention. Today you're going to hear from members of our policy team as well as one of our clients who will talk to you about what we're doing. As you know, the National Immigrant Justice Center is engaged in individual representation while advancing systemic reform. Those two pieces are so critical to really advancing a human rights agenda that is so, so necessary at this time in our country as we welcome immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers. So without further ado, I pass it along to our Director of Policy, Heidi Altman, who will introduce you to our client and our members of our policy team who will share with you the amazing strategic and innovative work that we're doing to ensure that each and every individual's rights are upheld and that their human dignity is respected. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Mary Meg, for being here today to join us for this policy corner and for your leadership always. And we want to start off with a big thank you to all of you who are on the call today. We know that everyone's lives are hectic and we always find it so meaningful that so many of you take the time to join us, uh, learn about the issues that um, we are passionate about and working on and share your insights and thoughts through the chats and questions as well. Um, as Mary Meg said, my name is Heidi Altman and I direct our policy work out of our Washington DC office. I'm going to do a brief introduction of who we are and what the agenda is today and then I'm really excited about the fact that we actually have most of the members of our policy team speaking along with a very special guest who is one of our um, beloved colleagues and clients who himself is an advocate and also recently re released from detention. Um, one of our team members who is not speaking today, who I also want to acknowledge at the top, is um, Nubia Fimbres, who you won't hear from, but is behind the scenes and coordinated and ensured that everything that happens for the next hour runs smoothly. So many thanks, Nubia. Um, so many of you um, are, I'm sure, longtime friends of NIJC, but for those of you who are new, you see on the slide the integrated approach that we are I'm so privileged to take to our human rights and immigrants' rights work. We integrate legal services, and you see those staggering numbers on the slide, with our federal impact litigation work, our federal policy work, local and state level policy work, um, and our wonderful communications team. And our policy team, we've really grown in recent years. Um, we now have a small team of five here in DC and we have a position in Chicago that I actually wanted to note, given the wonderful um, breadth of participation that we usually get in these sessions, that that position is now available. So if you or, if you or yourself um, in the market or know someone who is looking to do policy work in the Chicago, Cook County and Illinois area, please check out our website. Um, I wanted to just briefly overview some of the, the work that we do on our policy team um, and the way in which we ground that work in our shared values. Um, our, our policy work at NIJC is centered around the pursuit of transformative change, change that is designed to impact the systems that discriminate against and deny fundamental rights to NIJC clients and our immigrant and, and immigrant communities and unfortunately detention. Um, plays such a central impact in that destabilization, one of the systems that we're working the hardest to dismantle, and in their place to promote policies that embrace humanity and dignity and collective wellness. Our work aims to be responsive and accountable to the lived experiences of NIJC clients, their loved ones, and their broader communities. And so I want to dive right into what you're going to be hearing about today. Today, we're gonna to be talking about immigration detention and how we and our policy team and our integrated legal services, litigation policy and communication work advocate for its abolition. 
Um, as you know, detention is central to a lot of our work at NIJC. We're so proud to have an incredible team of attorneys who provide direct representation at county jails that contract with ICE throughout the Midwest. Our LGBT team provides direct representation to individuals who identify as LGBTQI plus throughout the country in detention facilities ranging from San Diego to Texas to right back in the Midwest. Um, and of course, it's central to a lot of our policy work. So what you're going to be hearing today is gonna to start with an overview of the issue. Where we are today, Nena, my wonderful colleague, Nena Gupta, is gonna kick us off with a discussion of um, what is unfortunately, as Mary Meg already hinted at, many promises that have been broken um, during the Biden administration with regard to the immigration detention system. From there, you'll hear from Jesse Franz Blau, who is going to break down some of the data and numbers that can sometimes be hard to understand and access to really get at the heart of this issue. And then Azadeh Irfani, who herself used to provide direct representation to immigrant youth um, in the detention system, is going to speak about some of the most concerning expansion we've seen um, of detention as it impacts young people. From there, we're gonna be so lucky to hear directly from our client, Robert Panton, um, as I said, a really tremendous advocate and fighter for justice himself. Jesse then is gonna take it back to talk a little bit about some of the expansion that we're seeing, and we're gonna close out with how you can join us in the advocacy efforts to fight back and push back against that expansion and toward abolition of the detention system writ large. So Nana, I'm going to toss it to you. Thanks so much, Heidi. Uh, hi, everyone. Nena Gupta, Associate Director of Policy here at NIJC. Um, thank you so much for joining us. So as both Mary Meg and Heidi have alluded to, um, today's presentation is a reality check. Um, nine months into the uh, Biden administration, unfortunately, um, we have not seen follow through uh, on the promises that we heard on the campaign trail and in the early days of the administration. Um, especially with regards to detention um, and the use of detention in our civil immigration system. Um, so, you know, what were the promises that were made that at the time seemed hopeful to us? President Biden, as a candidate, uh, promised explicitly to end privatized immigration detention, the use of private companies to run immigration detention facilities. Um, after his inauguration and in his first few weeks of presidency, as many of you may remember, um, the administration announced the phase out of the use of private prisons, but only in the criminal legal system um, and no such phase out on the immigration side. Uh, what that has meant since then um, is that just this month or just this past month in September, uh, we saw a new contract um, that ICE entered into with the private prison company GEO Group for a new facility in Pennsylvania. Um, we've also seen signals that another private prison company, Core Civic, is looking to ICE um, to take over an expiring contract with another facility in Tennessee, known for its uh, really del deleterious and horrible conditions. Um, an unintended consequence or although predictable, um, is that as private prison companies have lost business on the federal criminal side um, for prisons there, they're looking to the immigration system to make money off of the detention of immigrants. Um, we saw recently um, that um, money given to one private prison company even to be used um, to fly Haitians from the border back to Haiti um, as part of the Biden administration's expulsion policy, a new form of profit that helps them replace money that they've lost um, in the cutting of contracts on the criminal side. Uh, we also heard um, in the early months of the administration from DHS Secretary Mayorkas um, in testimony before Congress um, that he has concerns about, quote, the overuse of detention, um, stating that he will not tolerate the mistreatment of individuals in civil immigration detention or substandard conditions of detention facilities. And yet in action, what we've seen is that the agency is extending contracts and finding workarounds, even in states and localities who out of their own authority have taken steps to end private ICE detention in their area. 
We see the agency spending taxpayer dollars on a higher number of guaranteed minimum beds in the system. And what you'll hear about more as well um, in a moment, Biden's continuation, the president's continuation of Trump asylum policies at the border that are directly leading to an increase in detention. Um, and so with that, I will pass it over, uh, I believe to Jesse on our team um, who will dive in to, to share more about the numbers and what we're seeing in the detention system. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks so much, Nana. That was a really tremendous overview. I'm Jesse Fransbo, Senior Policy Analyst with the policy team. And I'll just add um, a little more uh, in terms of the numbers of what, what we've seen since the Biden-Harris administration came in office in January. So when they entered in office, uh, ICE detention numbers were actually around 14,000. Uh, and then we saw those numbers really um, troubling in a very troubling way. We saw those numbers um, rise to uh, over 27,000. So they nearly doubled by July of this year. Um, and today they're around 22,000 people in detention. Um, and what we're seeing uh, when you look at the numbers as well is the lion's share of people who are being sent to ICE detention are people who are being arrested uh, by Border Patrol, by CBP. So just last month, CBP arrested around 24,000 people. ICE arrested around 4,000 people out of the 28,000 people who were booked in to ICE detention in uh, September just last month. So the lion's share of people um, in ICE detention are being turned over by CBP, by Border Patrol, so picked up along the border. So really illustrating that um, ICE is definitely detaining asylum seekers, um, which my colleague Azade will speak about in more detail. Um, and another factor to highlight, there are around three quarters of the people in ICE detention have no criminal record. Many more have only minor offenses like traffic violations. Um, and so those are some of the, the numbers, just looking at the figures. And then the other element that we're seeing that's, uh, of course, really troubling, particularly given the promises that the Biden-Harris campaign made, um, is with regards to the for-profit immigration detention system. So we're seeing the ICE expansion of private detention. Um, so as Nana said, when um, President Biden and Vice President Harris entered into office, they had made a very clear promise to end private immigration detention. Um, and that has not happened. And what we have seen is that they have even entered into new contracts. So in facilities where the Bureau of Prisons has phased out their contracts with private prison companies uh, in response to the executive order that Nina mentioned earlier, um, what they've done in some instances, is they've just rolled that contract over to ICE um, or, 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 or more, uh, more plainly stated, ICE has come in and grabbed that contract um, to keep that jail open and, and use it to detain um, people in ICE detention. So this happened in, in the Moshannon Valley uh, in, in Pennsylvania. So a large jail that was a private prison jail uh, run by the company Geo Group. Um, ICE came in and grabbed that contract. So now they're going to be holding people in ICE detention in, 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 in Moshonan Valley in, in Pennsylvania. And this also, um, um, also in Pennsylvania, um, Berks County Detention uh, Center, which was a family prison, um, a, a family detention center, uh, rolled over to um, an adult women's detention center. So that's another facility in, in Pennsylvania. Um, and then what has also happened, um, as Nana mentioned, so in states where they're passing laws to ban immigration detention, um, ICE has taken measures to really circumvent those laws and get around those laws and expanded contracts with private prison companies. And this has happened in Washington state and in New Jersey um, just in, in the last few months. So another really um, problematic development. Um, I will pass it over now to, to my colleague Azadeh to talk a bit more about ICE detention of, uh, of children and the intersection with um, asylum seekers. Thanks so much, Jesse. Um, so yeah, as Jesse said, I'm Azadeh Arfani, Senior Policy Analyst um, here at NIJC's DC office as well. Um, thanks again, everyone, for joining. 
Um, so I'll be talking about something um, to start us off that has to do with um, something that's usually not associated with ICE, which is the detention of children. Um, so ICE is the agency that um, traditionally has been um, responsible for the detention of families. So you may have heard of different family um, jails that exist in Texas and in, in Pennsylvania. Um, those particular detention centers have, um, have shifted to a different use under the Biden administration. And um, for the most part, the Biden administration has uh, begun a different practice that is less reliant on detention with respect to families. Unfortunately, that practice um, of, of not favoring detention or basically deprioritizing the use of detention is not one that they've committed to with respect to children who are um, detained alone without their parents. So um, for the most part, when children are in detention, immigrant children are in detention in the US, they are in the custody of the Office of Refugee Resettlement. Um, however, in order to go into um, the custody of the Office of Refugee Resettlement, one has to be classified as unaccompanied. Um, so, in other words, the children who end up in ICE custody by themselves are children who um, don't benefit from that classification and are in fact stripped from their communities and taken away from their families um, in order to be placed in, um, in a detention center um, in a remote area of this country. Um, so, in particular, under the Trump administration, um, two different ICE juvenile jails um, closed down thanks to extensive advocacy and organizing. Those detention centers were in Washington State and Oregon. And um, there's a uh, fabulous report that goes over uh, the efforts that were undertaken in order to, to actually close down those facilities and um, to end the practice of um, committing local resources to the detention of um, children in ICE custody. However, um, come February, of one month into um, its time in office, the Biden administration entered into a new contract that basically permitted a detention center in Winchester, Virginia, to, uh, to jail children who were um, deemed accompanied, um, who basically had their lives, their families, their school, um, and um, to, to keep them jailed there in a detention center in Virginia. Um, what ended up happening is that one of the, the youth that, um, that was in a facility in Washington state that closed down was promptly transferred into that facility in uh, Virginia where he had to spend months until a, order, uh, until a judge ordered him released. Um, so, if you just take one moment and imagine how it feels. So that particular youth was actually living in Philadelphia with his family, had been bullied in school. And then, um, you know, he, he picked up a couple of um, juvenile adjudications um, that were nonviolent in nature. He was himself dealing with his own trauma and um, he uh, had a pending application for asylum. Um, instead of continuing his life, um, you know, in in, field, in the Philadelphia region, and um, you know, with the minimal impact that juvenile adjudications usually have on a child's life, this youth was first sent to Washington State, um, you know, on the other side of the country, um, only to be sent later to uh, to Virginia, where again he needed the intervention of a judge in order to be released. Um, that practice is incredibly harmful. There, there's no words for how much it impacts youth to be detained for months or years on end. Um, and it is um, simply, uh, it, it's a very simple call, right, for the, for the Biden administration to, um, to make the decision that um, jailing children is, um, is unacceptable. And unfortunately, that's um, something that we have yet to see and that we continue to push for here at NAGC. Um, now, switching to the next slide, um, we're going to talk over 
and talk about a different intersection um, from youth to the issue of asylum. So asylum and detention intersect in really interesting ways. Um, primarily, the, the way in which asylum uh, interfaces with detention is that, you know, you will hear the administration saying that it is implementing really strict border policies that won't let asylum seekers in because of, quote unquote, lack of capacity or lack of bed space in either CBP or ICE detention. So I'd like to put some huge red flags around that because that, um, whenever you hear that rationale, it's really cause for, uh, an, it really should ring an alarm for all of us. Because what that really means is that um, the entire process of asylum, um, of, you know, the lawful right of seeking asylum at the border um, is now completely intertwined with the use of detention. And what, what we see is that with policies such as Title 42 expulsions, which are a policy started under, under the Trump administration uh, where they weaponized the um, COVID-19 pandemic in order to shut down the border entirely, especially to asylum seekers and children. Um, their justification was, you know what, when asylum seekers come, we have to detain them and we have to detain them in congregate settings um, where it's impossible to follow COVID-19 guidelines. And if they get sick, they're going to crowd um, the pressure and the precious hospital resources um, and beds that are available locally um, to, the, to the domestic community. And again, the red flag here is we don't actually need to detain people who are coming to seek asylum. There is no um, nexus um, that actually justifies um, the use of detention because more than 90% of asylum seekers actually have uh, relatives or friends with whom they could shelter in place safely. And of course, nowadays, um, the US has the largest supply of vaccines available internationally. So the availability of protections under COVID-19 is um, overwhelming rather than scarce. Um, and nevertheless, the, the Biden administration is using the exact same talking points as the Trump administration. With the exception, of course, of public health officials, including Dr. Anthony Fauci, who have um, overwhelmingly condemned the use of, um, of a public health excuse in order to um, shut down the border to, um, to non-citizens, including asylum seekers. So in other words, there, there's really no, no justification um, from a public health standpoint to, um, to blame asylum seekers for an outbreak or to, um, to try to, um, uh, to shut them out of the U.S. entirely um, on the basis that they're going to um, spread the virus once inside detention. And of course, the, the, other, um, the other important thing is that this justification becomes a tacit a push for the administration to increase its bed space. So when advocates tell the administration, um, you have to reopen safe avenues for people to seek asylum at the border, the administration's response is to enter into the types of contracts that Jesse had just mentioned. They are effectively raising the amount of um, beds uh, and raising the amount of uh, opening new, entering into new contracts in order to detain larger amounts of people, continuing the same broken policies that we've seen for the past decades that truly have no, um, no public safety um, uh, nexus so, or rationale. Um, so it becomes uh, helpful both to close the border and to justify its reopening uh, detention becomes intertwined entirely with the asylum system as um, the U.S. government is setting it up um, at this time. So um, there's it, it, it may be it may be redundant to say this, but there's um, no uh, belief within the international community that detention is at all necessary for asylum seekers, and we've been 
calling on the Biden administration to end all detention, including um, the detention of asylum seekers because of um, the, the simple lack of um, rationale behind it. So now I'll turn it back over to Nina to take us to um, speak with a former client of us. Thank you so much, uh, Azadeh. So I'm just so proud um, and honored to introduce to all of you um, an IJC client um, and an advocate in his own right, Robert Panton. Um, his words, which you will hear in a moment from his home in Florida, uh, where he now sits as a free man, speak uh, for themselves. Um, Robert spent 30 years in federal prison on a sentence that he received for a nonviolent conviction in the criminal legal system. Uh, a conviction today that would not trigger such a long and harsh sentence due to uh, recent criminal legal reforms. But after serving these three decades in prison, a judge granted him compassionate release, commending Robert for his extensive work uh, and programming during his time in prison, particularly in service of mentoring young people. But on the day of his release, ICE was waiting outside to pick him up. Despite Robert's older age and some medical conditions and vulnerabilities to COVID-19, he was taken directly to an immigration detention facility. Um, at NIJC, um, after Biden's election, we made multiple efforts to get Robert released. Under the president's um, latest enforcement priorities at that time, uh, Robert should not have been placed into immigration detention in the first instance, but he still was. And even with help from two members of Congress um, who made calls to ICE, uh, it took us several months um, and a few refusals before Robert was finally released from immigration detention. Um, today, as I said, He's home in Florida, but frequently between there and New York, um, where he's actively involved in an incredible campaign called Too Young to Die, where he continues his work supporting young people who are um, in some trouble. And so with great pleasure, I want to introduce Robert, um, who's going to share with uh, his story with all of us today. Thank you so much, Robert, for being here. We can't hear you yet, Robert. Are you speaking yet? Oh, I think we might be able to hear you now. You can you see me also? Because I... yes, we can. I think we can see and hear you. You sound great. Thanks Hello. so much. My name is Robert Panton. I thank you for having me. And IJC been a blessing to me in a lot of ways. One of the ways was after being incarcerated for 30 years with a life sentence for a nonviolent drug offense that conspiracy was the charge which carried only probably 12 years the federal justice system and the immigration system has the same flaws and one of them is the laws that's applied and put on the books after they analyze it they're not quick enough to change it to correct errors the 1948 act 1984 Act was implemented that had a federal sentencing guidelines. So a charge that carried 12 years or 10 years or eight years, enhancements was given for things that wasn't, he was not indicted for. And that's how I ended up with a life sentence. The Supreme Court came back in 2000 to say that that was illegal and unconstitutional. Well, it never made it retroactive. In other words, they said they was doing something for 20 years or more, and it was illegal, but they didn't correct it. So I served 30 years of a life sentence, but I was not despondent in prison to the point where I wouldn't try to benefit myself. And I gained a paralegal agreement and joined organizations that would help youth, that family court was sent to us so we could talk to them and put them on the right path if they would listen and follow guidance. So therefore, Judge Prescott, the Southern District of New York, later on when Congress implemented a law called the First Step Act, it was about giving a person a second chance. And then the Second Chance Act came into play. And this enabled me to receive discretionary review and my judge released me after 30 long years. So 
the flaws of serving time like that, you would think, well, this man served 20 years more than he had to on a census that was illegal while the Supreme Court sat around. And a judge's discretion released him to find that ICE is waiting to give him double jeopardy, meaning punish him again for the same crime, a nonviolent drug offense. I did not expect that. I thought they would either let me have a review as they did on the Obama administration in the prison via video and a judge would tell me a day to appear in court. But they took me to a detention center. Detention center was almost, and I'm not saying this for explosive feelings, it was a little bit worse than some of the penitentiaries in the United States. Why? We had cells in the United States penitentiary. We had, it may have been violent in different areas or whatever the case may be, but you had your own bed. You get to the detention center and there's a 12 man in a cell that's only for 10 people with people on the mattress on the floor. Prior to going to this area, you'll be in an area where everybody will be on the floor and a gym. What that does, Recreation, which the people would have normally had coming to this gym area, is now out the way. So you find yourself sometimes in one 20 by 20 room for weeks at a time where you only go out to get fresh air on outside recreation one time a week. Now that there is unjust, especially for civil proceedings, which is what immigration becomes. So. Wow, how good it is to be free. And thanking RJC for helping out. After six or seven months in detention, running from the fear of having COVID and other ailments that I had, high blood pressure, raised to the ceiling, being in areas where some people will go out to court and come back in and never be tested for COVID and put back in this same dorm. A person like myself, I had pneumonia twice in federal prison. So my phobia was heightened to the, the 10th power. With this, all I could do is make complaints, talk to my lawyers in NRJC who would also complain to the institution and the advocates that they were speaking out to in Congress to try to help my situation. I benefited from it eventually. No one in a civil proceeding should be warehoused unconstitutionally at that to the point where they can be injured from their health. So if a person have nonviolent offense or they just made asylum, they're waiting for asylum, why should they have to wait in custody? They have alternatives to detention, which I'm on now. And that seven months that I spent there was unnecessary. And also, it was not only unnecessary, it was a switch from one administration to the next. If Congress made laws that would be fair and just and think of the humane treatment that people deserve, then we wouldn't have this problem where administration to administration get ready to do what they think um, suits them politically. So after being in that situation and being told I was going to be released, the first thing I can say is this. A nation of laws have to follow the law. Have to. The AEDPA was implemented in 1996. Prior to 1996 in IRA, there was discretionary review for the Attorney General of the United States to let certain people just either be waived or they can dismiss the case, the proceedings of immigration and unjust, unfair to the individual. My conviction is in 1991. That's a facto clause says that no law should apply harsher than when a crime took place or the conviction for that matter. Today, now I'm facing deportation proceedings that has no discretion on it for the Attorney General of the United States. And why is that? when it's violating itself, the constitution again, just like it did in the criminal proceedings. My thought is this, that people are going home at night 
without thinking about humanity as a whole in the process of implementing laws and then promoting them. There's no way that a person should be told they're violating the law and at the same time, the law itself is not being upheld properly. So as I'm fighting this case now that I'm free and out here, I could be an advocate for the people who's voiceless alongside NIJC to bring awareness to the situation that's happening inside the institutions of not only the federal prison, but immigration. The privatization is the biggest problem why immigration law don't work sometimes. Why? Because people make a profit off of warehousing people. They have no incentive to follow the law. So in federal prison, after they had built all these penitentiaries and created an economy in rural areas, they was not going to go and make a law retroactive that would be releasing people after they served 10 years, which is enough. It's paying a debt to society is a must. Everybody agree to that. Immigration people, they want to follow the proceedings to see how they can find themselves in a legal status instead of running around not knowing what's going to happen to them tomorrow. So the most people will come right back and deal with the court if they're released, like myself. I'm thinking Biden and his administration was going to do the best things for us when I'm watching the news. President Biden, we was cheering him on. He's going to follow up on some of the things that the Obama administration, when he was vice president, had talked about. But this is a backdrop. We're sadly disappointed up until now. But we hold hope because it's a young session has begun. I hope they take the time out to look at the laws and implementation of them and find out if there's a better solution to the problem. The New Way Forward Act, it supports justice for the immigrant. And I think they should take the time to look at it. Now that I'm released, I have to found an organization that me and the co-founder, Madi Salam, started that can help young people. This is what I did in prison. This is not nothing new for me. I know how children grow up and they're a product of the society and their parents and the environment that they're in. And sometimes they stumble because everything I learned in the United States, I was here when I was four years old. I came here legally. I came here on a green card. So now I'm a product of society and anything that happens is because society helped me be who I am. It's just a plus for them because today I'm a great person in my own right because I'm all for justice and doing the right thing legally. The kids, the youth, and too young to die, they get mentorship. They get to look at their life better than the way they seen it from being far away. They get to leave their environment and come around to other areas like upstate New York to apple farms, where they can see that there's places where people relax instead of the inner cities. So this organization, they make their money through t-shirts that says too young to die, um, poetry from Maddie Salam, which is blowing up to 24 times 18 and it's sold. So we can have, we also receive donations from private funding and organizations to help us out. But the immigration system right now, President Biden needs to take a look at it. And when he looked at it, he should look at it from words of his own mouth. He made statements about things that he knew wasn't right. The privatization of uh, immigration and housing is why people do not want to let immigrants out while they wait through their proceedings. If you said this, Mr. President, you knew it was wrong. Why not take steps to, to work towards that? And I'm not saying you're not. I'm saying it's not happening fast enough and people are suffering. I thank y'all for the time y'all gave me to point this situation out. And I'm willing to be an advocate constantly while I'm out here to bring awareness to this situation. I thank you. And I return the speaking back to Jesse or Nina or Heidi. Thank you for this time. Thank you so much, Robert. It's, it's incredibly powerful to hear you speak. We're so grateful. For you for you joining and, and sharing and really breaking down um, not only your story but 
the way that the system operates and the infrastructure of ICE detention system. It's so incredibly helpful to have, have you share that. Um, um, another um, story we'd, we'd like to share of someone who is um, still in detention, um, unfortunately, someone who NIJC has been representing, um, Camilo, who we're using a, a pseudonym because Camilo is still in, in detention. Um, and um, he was detained um, at the border, so crossing the border um, in an effort to seek asylum. He's fleeing, fleeing violence in El Salvador, fleeing gang violence. Um, but when he entered, CBP agents ran his information and found um, allegations of affiliation with gangs, even though he was actually fleeing gang violence. So NAJC has been working to try to counter those allegations um, to try to get uh, Camilo released from detention. Um, in the meantime, Camilo is facing really extraordinary abuses in ICE detention, um, harassment um, for being gay, um, racist taunts and abuse from guards, and, and a really dire situation. We'll share um, a complaint that NIJC filed on behalf of Camilo um, with the Office of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties documenting the abuses that um, he's experiencing and asking for an investigation and asking for his immediate release. Um, on the next slide, I'll discuss a little bit about what's going on across the country in pushing back against ICE detention. So there is really incredible mobilization that's been happening. That's been happening for many years. Um, but what we've been seeing in, in recent years um, is um, because of the enormous amount of organizing, the power of communities um, uh, working together with people in detention, formerly people um, released, formerly detained individuals, family members, um, organizing to shut down facilities um, in their communities to end immigration detention in their neighborhoods and in, in their cities and towns. Um, what's happened in a lot of places is that state legislators uh, and county officials have voted to end up ICE contracts, um, which has been a really powerful testament to, um, to organizers, um, people like Robert, people who have been fighting, fighting back against the uh, immigration detention system. And what we've seen, um, even recently, members of Congress are calling specifically for ICE detention facilities to be closed down. So members of Congress um, from California uh, just wrote a letter to the administration asking them to close down um, some very notorious ICE detention centers in California, a really powerful letter. Um, and part of this, part of these campaigns really center around this notion of, of just closures. So on the next slide, um, we talk a little bit about how the some of the um, kind of basic elements of just closures campaign. So the center, the center element is that this should be approached with um, um, with uh, looking at people um, to be released from detention rather than being transferred to another facility when when a detention center does close. So here are some of the the, the kind of main aspects of these of these campaigns. Um, that we can share out some more resources. Um, this is one, the Dignity in Act Detention Campaign. This is actually in California. These groups that have teamed up with Detention Watch Network and other organizations um, wrote this paper in June on just closures that, that we can also um, add to the resources. That's a really good resource. Um, uh, on the next slide, I'll discuss a little bit what's been happening um, close to home for, for a lot of people, I think, on, on on this call, so Illinois, um, after many, uh, after a long, a long struggle to organize against immigration detention in the state, uh, NIJC has been involved in for for many years, um, and um, with with partner organizations, um, the Illinois State Legislature passed the New Way Forward Act, which will phase out um, all immigration detention contracts. Um, by by next year, and so what happened in, earlier this year? So in in August, um, the Pulaski County detention, the Pulaski County ended its contract with ICE to hold people in its um, in its county jail. 
And so they did this ahead of the implementation of the New Way Forward Act. Um, but what happened was uh, ICE um, gave very little time to actually review cases to ensure that people were um, released and not transferred. So um, family members and advocates um, really went into full, um, full speed to submit release requests on behalf of their loved ones and community members detained in Pulaski. And um, what happened initially, only three, because of the really short time, time frame that ICE gave, um, uh, which is about a week, only three individuals were initially released while all the other people in that facility were transferred. Um, but then ICE headquarters, they, they committed to another review. Um, since then, there have been 12 people released um, and NIGC and partner organizations continue to push for a, a, an actual, really clear, clear ad review uh, of the cases um, of the people who were transferred um, to advocate for their, their release, um, their safe release, where communities, um, community organizations are very willing um, and ready to, to support where, where needed when people are released. Um, NIGC and partner groups have also um, developed uh, recommendations for standard operating procedures for when ICE actually closed down a facility um, to push for ICE to actually carry out a case review uh, of each case and with um, and look towards release of individuals um, when these facilities close. So a few of the recommendations include um, the administration should begin with the presumption of release, not transfer. They should review each case um, with regular communication with legal service providers and community members. They should um, embrace community-based alternatives and just transitions from final immigration attention. Um, and so um, on the next, next slide, I'll discuss a, a few of the action items of ways that um, people can get involved in, in these type of campaigns, that people can support efforts to try to close down ICE detention facilities and, and, and try to and, and support advocacy efforts um, around just closures. So one of the ways is reaching out to members of Congress. Um, the Defund Hate campaign, which we have a link here, uh, is a campaign that looks to push for divestment uh, from enforcement. Um, uh, towards towards community development, um, and people can also look at local groups that are working to oppose the expansion in Clay County, which is a Clay County, County Indiana, uh, a neighboring um, facility that ICE uses to, to hold people in detention. Um, people can take a look at the efforts to try to oppose the expansion of that jail, which um, will be used to, to hold more people in ICE detention if they do go through with that expansion. Um, people can support the Detention Watch Network, their communities, not cages campaign. Um, there are also petitions, um, one petition going around to end the contract in McHenry County uh, in Illinois, which is one of the facilities that is supposed to close. Um, it's one of the county jails that is supposed to uh, end its contract with ICE um, as a result of the, the New Way Forward Act, the, the state New Way Forward Act in Illinois. Um, there are other petitions to shut down Adelanto, a very notorious facility on California. There's um, petitions to demand that Farmville, the third town council, um, and its contract with ICA and ICE. Um, this is a detention facility in Northern Virginia um, that detains, that has bed space to detain over 500 people uh, that became the worst COVID outbreak facility um, during the pandemic and now only holds around 20 people. Um, and there are growing efforts to try to get the local town council to close down that facility. Um, I will pass it off now to, um, to my colleague Heidi to talk a little bit more about opportunities to get involved and then um, go into Q&A. Thanks so much, Jesse, um, and thanks to all of our speakers. We've had some, some really dynamic questions coming in the chat, and so I'm going to invite actually all our speakers um, to come back on video with me, and we'll do some live Q&A drawn from the questions that you've shared. 
Um, but before we close out the opportunities to take action, we tried today to present some more localized opportunities to take action. But I also want to just take a moment to note that for any of you who are on the line who take on pro bono work through NIJC, we are grateful and indebted to you and celebrate you during this pro bono week. Um, but I also want to note that we do have a long list of individuals who are in need of representation. We're um, in a crunch moment in terms of our need for pro bono support. So please um, reach out to us if you are interested in or have colleagues who might be able to consider taking on a pro bono matter through NIJC. And with that, we're going to pivot to our questions. Um, thanks to everyone who asked. There's been a lot of questions that were prompted by Azadeh's presentation on the Winchester facility. Um, and about what the difference is between juvenile facilities that are run by ICE versus those that are run by or contracted with the Office of Refugee Resettlement within the Department of Health and Human Services. So, Azadeh, I'm going to ask if you can help orient us towards those overlapping system and who is detained where um, and, and why. Absolutely. And my apologies that this is confusing to be honest it's a confusing system altogether um, and one that's fairly hard to navigate as as you can imagine especially if you have a child who's caught up in, in one of those systems um, so what happens with uh with children in the custody of the office of refugee resettlement is that the vast majority of those children are crossing the border first held in by the customs and border protection um, officers in, in those facilities. And then within 72 hours, they're supposed to be transferred into ORR custody. Um, those children are sent to ORR with the, with the vision that basically they're, um, they're supposed to receive a different kind of care than they are um, from the, basically it's bifurcating the agency that is prosecuting them for crossing the border um, and not having documents uh, from the agency that's detaining them, which is ORR. Um, so there's certain benefits, if you will, from that classification, as well as um, in terms of the ways in which they are able to seek protection. Children who are uh, in ICE custody usually are end up in ICE custody because they were apprehended um, in the interior. So they were, um, Free, oftentimes um, already living with their families, um, so in a way deemed accompanied because they had their legal guardian or their parent by their side. Um, and ICE comes into contact with them uh, because of some kind of hit um, oftentimes. So in the case that I was telling you about of the youth who ended up in Winchester, Virginia, the juvenile adjudications um, are are the, the flags that ICE used in order to come and take him away from his family. So that's that's roughly the difference. And in terms of the difference in facilities, some of you have asked about the Shenandoah Valley Juvenile Center. It's the highest level of security in ORR detention, which is uh, frankly, basically a juvenile jail. Um, similarly, ICE um, facilities are also juvenile jails. So. Um, with the difference that children are less connected to attorneys, less connected to mental health support, um, and um, and the different kinds of services that are available under ORR. Thank you so much, Azade. And yeah, it's a complex <laughs> overlapping network. Um, we had a few questions come in about the duration of detention. How long are people jailed by ICE? Who decides for how long they're jailed and why is it sometimes so long? So I'm going to actually ask two questions pulled from this, the first for Robert and the second for Nana. And we're a little short on time, but hopefully we'll have time for both. Um, Robert, I was wondering because your experience was First, that of incarceration through the criminal legal system and then moving into ICE custody. If you could talk about what may, what felt different being in a setting in ICE detention where there was no end date on your detention and it was unclear, indefinite um, when you might be released, how that impacted you and if you're willing to share how you saw that impact others. Um, and then after that, we'll turn to Nina with another question. Due process 
is given in the uh, Bureau of Prison real easily. And you kind of know your situation and you know which way you can go for help. As we just pointed out, there's a lot of people in detention that don't know which way to turn. And then if you don't have no information from the court proceedings of uh, immigration judge, when this is going to be finalized and that you have rights of, let me see, attorneys, so forth, that's informed to you. But then when you think about when is this going to be a process where I'm even going to know that the laws is going to be applied to me, where I'm not going to be facing deportation after administration that changes. Obama administration, they had a certain position that they had. The Trump administration was that, oh, everybody that's released, bring them in. Uh, it was daunting. And psychologically, it played a role on me that when you're locked in one room with 12 people and two of us is laying on the floor, and then you only get one hour recreation and you're there miserable as it is worrying about COVID because people are going back and forth to court and coming back into the institution. It's like somewhat torturous and I don't say that lightly. So worrying about when this is going to end even today for me now, I've been here since I was three years old. What do I know about any place else? It did my first offense, first time in prison for a nonviolent offense or conspiracy, second chance. I thought that's what the country is about. So I was really, you don't know the relief it is right now. I can imagine how a child goes through this without his parent right there with him. I imagine a parent don't know where their child at when Trump administration misplaced the children. I was sitting and feeling so hurt just watching the news. Sometimes I just thought watching the news was going to be the thing that just made me say to myself, well, I'm, it's hopeless. But prayer and hope just leave me there waiting and wondering when the next phase is going to begin. Thank you so much, Robert. And hearing you use the word torture, it, it really does resonate. I will note that that is a word that we hear regularly from people who have experienced ICE detention. Um, Nana, I'm going to give you the last word to discuss a little bit about why ICE detention is sometimes indefinite in nature and who the decision makers are over when and for how long a person is jailed by ICE. Yeah, thanks Heidi and Robert. Um, thank you again. So I'm going to start with the second question, who, who's, you know, who decides how long someone's in? Um, that's DHS and ICE, our current immigration laws give the agencies broad prosecutorial discretion to decide who is sitting in a detention center and for how long they are there. They can make those decisions on the individual level based on whether someone's a danger to their community or a flight risk. Um, and that's, that's decision making that should be happening in individual cases. Um, we've seen the agency exercise this kind of prosecutorial discretion at the systemic level. We see memos we have seen memos in the past that say certain groups of folks shouldn't be held in detention because of vulnerabilities they have or medical conditions we ha they have. Um, so in other words, there's no law that mandates that someone has to be in detention. Even one statute that says people with certain kinds of criminal convictions must be in ICE custody, even those folks um, from our view do not have to be in detention. And we've seen the agency release people like that. Um, you know, the other way that folks um, get, you know, have an opportunity to be released from detention is before an immigration judge through a custody hearing, a bond hearing in front of a judge. Um, but so many problems with our system, like lack of access to appointed counsel, to a lawyer, um, make um, winning those cases hard. Um, also, the fact um, that often releases are dependent on bond and we haven't seen progress in reforming bond amounts and the way that we've seen on bail reform on the criminal side. Um, so we're seeing folks who can't get out because they can't afford the money that's required to be paid. Um, and I think that the point about why we get folks who are indefinitely inside is a conflation of a lot of factors of our broken system. We see that you know, ICE and DHS do not always exercise this broad prosecutorial discretion they have um, in just ways. It's enforced in, in differing ways across the country. Um, 
profit incentives and motives like the ones Robert and Jesse spoke to make reason to keep people inside detention rather than to release them. Um, and, you know, again, the, the kind of like prolonged um, nature of our immigration system means that people might sit inside for months and months and months while they're trying to fight their immigration case. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Heidi, who will, I think finally conclude us. <laughs> thank you, Nina. I want to thank all of you. I think uh, Robert might have one last point to make. You're um, muted, Robert. Go to ingeniousign.com and you can see what immigrants can do with the time you can release them instead of holding them in the custody. And they can deal with their court proceedings on the outside while the process takes place and while the president and everybody fix the laws up in Congress get their um, ducks in a row about fairness and justice. You'll see what a person can do if you give them a chance to because everybody deserves a second chance. Thank you, Heidi. What a beautiful note to end on. There is a better way, right? We can invest in our communities instead of in jails. Um, I am so grateful to all of you who took the time to be here with us today. Thank you to Nana, to Jesse, to Azade for speaking. Thank you to Nubia for speaking. Um, and the most heartfelt gratitude to you, Robert, for being here with us today, for being willing to share your story and for your leadership and advocacy um, in your community and nationally. We are grateful. Um, please keep in touch with us. We look forward to seeing you at the next Policy Corner. Thank you.